Okay, next is our final task, task number three, and here we're going to deal with traffic engineering metrics on a tunnel that has the forwarding adjacency configured. First, we need to create another MPLS TE tunnel, tunnel number two, from R1 to R2 using the following parameters. So it will be again another 500k tunnel, and the explicit path we're going to have is direct from R1 to R3 and then R2. Let me get rid of all this. So just to do a quick recap. Looks like it's not going to erase them all. Let me try to bring up a new diagram. Okay, so quick recap here. We have our tunnel, tunnel number one that goes from R1 to R2 that traverses R5 here. And currently we have a load balancing going on on R1 that used the both IP path and the tunnel. We're now going to create a second tunnel, tunnel number two, that goes from R1, R3, and then directly to R2. Okay, but this tunnel is going to be using a forwarding adjacency uh, method. And whenever we mention a forwarding adjacency, that means you have to create a bidirectional sets of tunnels. So we're also going to have to create, as uh, specified right here, create another MPLS TE tunnel in the opposite direction from R2 to R1 using the same parameter. Okay, so we're also going to have another tunnel that extends from R2 to R1. And then we're going to try to see by creating that tunnel with a forwarding adjacency, how that's going to affect the routing decision made uh, by R1. Okay, so let's first start the configuration on router R1. As always, start with the explicit path command, since we're dealing with a, a fixed path. Name this one, is going to call it R32. And actually, we might have had that configured. So let me see. Back in our task number one, so R32. And right there, we do. So we can just go ahead and create a tunnel number two with IP and number loopback zero. Tunnel destination is going to be R2 loopback zero. Tunnel mode, MPLS, traffic engineering. Tunnel MPLS, traffic engineering. We're going to use a forwarding adjacency. And then set the bandwidth. So bandwidth is 500k. And then configure our path option. One, explicit. And the name of the explicit path is R32. Okay, give it a second. The tunnel came up. Let's complete the other direction, which is from R2. Let me see if I can just copy most of the tunnel interface configuration. There you go. Let me bring up Notepad. We're going to have to configure the IP explicit path name R31 because it's going to go from R2, R3, and then R1. Next top will be router R3. And then next one would be router R1. We're still going to use the tunnel 2. It's going to terminate on router R1. That's the default. And then copy, paste. Then that's going to have to be paste on R2. Okay, no errors. And then the tunnel came right up. Okay, so now if you go back to R1 and do a show MPLS traffic engineering tunnel, TU2. Let's see, let's see from the top, we have our operation status, uh, operational status being up, it's connected, and the pathway is 30, and that's ex expected since we modify the IGP metrics right here to be 20, so 20 plus 10 on R1, that gives you 30. And it's saying also that the shortest path from R1 to R2 right now only has the pathway of 20, and that's the, the bottom path that we modify the metrics of 5 and 5, and that's why it gives it uh, 20. So metric-wise, the router R1 sees the bottom path to be a shortest path for this, even though it's physically has one more hop than the path in the middle here. Okay, so now that we have the bidirectional sets of tunnel configured between R1 and R2, that particular tunnel should be seen by the rest of the network as a link. And that's what we have talked about in the previous video. So as far as all of the routers are concerned, this particular tunnel is just like a piece of cable that connects R1 to R2. To also to kind of prove that, you can look at the 
ISIS database. So if you do a show ISIS on R1, will be level two. And we want to specifically look at what's being advertised by R1. And then detail, you can see that links right here is the tunnel one with the forwarding adjacency configured. You can see that the metrics by default is just like any other link with the ISS metric of 10, even though that the tunnel actually has gone through two hops or even multiple hops. But like I said, the rest of the network view that particular tunnel as a single link, and that's why it gives it the metrics of 10. Okay, and because of that, if you do a show IP route, ISIS, you can see that all the routes for R7 loopback is now pointing out of the tunnel two because the metrics or the cost metrics of that route is now 30. Okay, and it's being 30 because that tunnel two has the metrics or ISS metrics of 10. That interface adds another 10 and then the loopback adds another 10. 10 plus 10 plus 10, that gives you 30. And that's obviously lower than the metrics of all of the routes that were there before right here that were 40, whether it's go, uh, through a tunnel one or the path, the IP path is going through R4. Since 30 is better than all of those, that's why these routes are being replaced by tunnel two right now. Okay, so the tunnel can pretty much go through as many hops as it needs to, but eventually it's still gonna be seen as a directly connected link with the ISIS IGP metrics of 10. Okay, and that's the behavior of the tunnels with the forwarding adjacency. Okay, and the last thing that we need to do here is to reconfigure the MPLS TE tunnel two so that R1 load balance traffic to R7 loopbacks between IP path to R4, tunnel one, and tunnel two. Like I mentioned just now, the bottom path right now to R7 loopback costs 40. The top path also right now costs 40. So this path right here, that costs 40. The middle path that goes across the tunnel two costs only 30. So for us to have R1 load balance the traffic towards R7 loopback between these three paths, we're gonna to have to kind of increase the metrics of tunnel two from 10. So we're gonna increase that right now. The default is 10. We're gonna to have to increase that to pretty much 20. So that will result in the middle path here has the cost of 40 that's equal to the other path top and the bottom. So that's what we're gonna do is to change the ISIS metrics of tunnel two to 20 to make that happen. So now if you go to interface tunnel two, ISIS metric, and then change that to 20, give it a second, do show IP route ISIS, go all the way to the bottom. You can see right here, now that the end-to-end -end path metrics for a tunnel two to get to R7 loopback has been increased to 40, you can now see the other two path that also has the metrics of 40. And now our one's gonna load balance the traffic to these subnets between these three paths. The first one is IP path and the other two is obviously the MPLS TE tunnel. Okay, we can try to do a trace route one more time. It should pick one of the path and it looks like it picks the same path as before, which is the bottom one. One last thing that I kind of forgot to point out to you guys when we change the metrics type on the tunnel from the TE metrics by default to the IGP when you do the show MPLS traffic engineering tunnel and we did that on the tunnel one. Let me kind of go past that and then let's take a look at tunnel one and that's the command right here that I mentioned, metrics IGP. And for tunnel one, you can actually tell from that on the show command output right here, it said metric type is IGP. Compare that to the tunnel number two that we left at default. It says right here, the metric type is TE. All right, and that's pretty much the last thing I want to point out. And we are pretty much complete with our task number three. Okay, so now that we have spent more time with the MPLS TE metrics, you can see that playing around with the T metric is not really pretty. Changing the metric on the tunnel itself might not be as bad, but once you start, you know, fiddling around with the interface level metrics, whether it's where you're changing the IGP metrics itself or some of the or hard coded the TE metrics with the administrative weight, 
command like we did earlier in this lab, you can potentially affect multiple things that could be all of the tunnel that goes across that particular link. So I would definitely advise against doing that unless you absolutely need to. And also the other thing that we have dealt with twice in this lab is the trying to load balance between the IP path and the T tunnel. You can see that's kind of cumbersome also because mostly you have to manipulate some of the IGP metrics to make the load balancing between IP path and the tunnel possible. At that point, it might be actually easier to build another TE tunnel to replace the IP path and then just kind of deal with the tunnel metrics himself. Okay, so that's pretty much wraps up our video on MPLS TE metric. You can visit our website to view an extensive list of our lab videos and sign up to get access to additional lab contents. Thank you for watching labminutes.com and I'll see you guys in the next video.